five, four, three, two, wonderful. Hold on tight, Jimmy. Hold on tight. Hold on. Welcome to Hope is Wonderful. Um, I'm very excited to uh, have my next guest on. Uh, Jamie Tall is uh, somebody that inspired me uh, several months ago, and, and, and I think I'm on uh, to a trend where I bring on the people that had such a huge impact, huge impact on my life. Uh, Jamie works with uh, trauma survivors. Um, she has worked on uh, protocols for therapy for those survivors. Um, she's a pillar in the Athens and, and greater Atlanta uh, community, uh, both uh, from a recovery standpoint and, and now also uh, she uh, helps host Stand Up for Recovery. Um, she's a teacher, um, a podcaster, a coach. She's now a friend. Uh, she inspired me, and, and I believe she'll inspire you. So, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. I'm so glad I finally got to get on here. You know, uh, it, it's funny, and I, and I do want to go back and reference it. Um, so, um, early on in my recovery, um, I had gone to to Vision Warriors up in Woodstock, and I was, you know, supporting my friend and counselor, our last guest, David. Um, and so I happened to follow him, not thinking much of it, no intention of actually, uh, you know, catching another live broadcast. It just wasn't on my agenda of things to do. And so the next Friday, I, I'm sitting there, and and you come on. And uh, you begin to tell your story. And obviously at the time I was, you know, knee deep in my first run at the 12 steps. And you began to go down a path that, that at that moment I had believed in myself that, that there would be a time for me to, to speak up and talk about what I was experiencing both from a mental health and then obviously from an addiction standpoint. Um, but your story... Um, you know, it, it, it's crazy to me, and obviously it's a mission of mine that when we do these podcasts, uh, this whole this whole venture is about blessing one human being, never knowing who you might touch. And, and that day you touched me, and, and in a way that, you know, I, I, find it, I find it difficult that I find people that really inspire me. And I would say without a shadow of a doubt, that was one of those moments when I... I heard the voice of God say, it's time for you to do that. And it was because of you and your authenticity, your rawness, your just, your, your, your passion, um, your belief. Um, I think more than anything during this journey, there's so much shame that comes with it. And so to hear somebody embrace it, and not only embrace it, but embrace it with a smile and laugh about it, which just seemed unfathomable at the time for myself so um thank you so much from the bottom of my heart and i'm so grateful that you agreed to uh come on come on board and you know be one of my first victims here on the on the on the podcast yes i had no idea that you saw that actually <laughs> you know uh, no i didn't know that you watched that one yeah i love them over there they i have a uh, my favorite t-shirt is from them uh no high like the most high <laughs> right right yes and we can absolutely relate to that statement especially because of the many highs we've had um and you know how that's redefined um our lives in many ways both from um what i get high off today you know moments like this where i get to talk with somebody that um i've come to care about i've come to get to know a little bit um you know, hopefully I'll have the opportunity to encourage you in the same way you have me. Um, but, you know, what was so unique about your story was, um, you know, and I shared with you the other night, um, at one point in time, I, was, I wasn't I was somebody I was very proud of. And I certainly wasn't proud of how I treated women. Um, I To this day, there are relationships that I've gone back and tried to restore apologize um, for um, things that I did things that I said um, how I treated them um, and even one very recently that when we were sitting there I, I began my amends and you know of course somebody says oh no 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 it's fine you know nothing happened 
and then you finish and then they bring up something and you're like, I knew it was, <laughs> I knew it was there. Um, but that, that transition transitioned us, you know, or, or, or me not only recognizing it and hearing it in your story, but I began to empathize and understand what I saw women go through in recovery uh, in my own life as I went to different meetings and, um, you know, this meteoric rise of, as you know, I volunteer for Hope Link. Um, you know, I didn't go back and see the past. I can't see pre-pandemic numbers or, you know, uh, requests. Um, but I can tell you that the requests that come in now, um, it it does appear to be closer to 50-50 than what I think we've statistically thought, which is probably closer to 2080. Um, and so, you know, that kind of takes us to your story and, um, you know, whatever you feel comfortable sharing about that and, um, you know, how you found recovery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I grew up in a alcoholic, chaotic, violent household. Um, my first addiction was to escape. And so I escaped in many different ways, uh, whether that be reading books, um, whether that be playing Nintendo, um, whatever that was, uh, writing stories. And, um, you know, I moved a lot. My parents moved a lot. I went to 12 different schools by the time I graduated high school. Um, by the time I got to high school, I'm sorry. And oh, wow. every time that I would go to a different school, I would make up a new character, right? <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, well, now I'm going to be this Jamie because that Jamie didn't seem to make friends good enough or whatever because uh, just like all the other people that we know in recovery it's hard enough for us to be comfortable in our own skin never mind having a crazy chaotic household that we're trying to you know not let anybody know about trying to act like everything is just fine and my family growing up a very um authentic Sicilian household where you know you don't take the problems outside of the house you know the problems stay in the house what happens in the family stays in the family and you just kind of sweep everything under the rug and you're like you know but dad went to jail you know <laughs> we're not going to talk about that <laughs> you know um but mom you were screaming and crying fighting for your life last night no we're not going to talk we're, we don't talk about those things you know uh so it kind of like gave me a really skewed view of many things. Um, first of all, it gave me a very skewed view of what love looked like. Real love was supposed to look like. Uh, also, it gave me a very performance-based value of myself. So this idea that if I performed well or acted a certain way, that I would be accepted, that I would be loved... Um, and so that kind of set me up to when I finally did get to high school and met my first group of friends, they were the first people to love me and embrace me for exactly who I was. And they were drug dealers. And that is just where I fell to fit in. And, you know, it was really fun at first. There was, uh, this first time I went to a party where I found out, you know, what the solution I'd been looking for for my whole entire life was I was at this party and I was really trying to fit in. I was so nervous, anxiety, and wanted everybody to like me. And all of a sudden they started passing around some substances and, you know, just high school fun stuff, you know, those funky colored beer wine things. <laughs> Oh, like the you... Seagram's wine coolers, like the like Bartles the... and James with the old men on the front porch, <laughs> like the the big blue, the big blue wine or, or beer, whatever. Um, and so, I think they're called Boone's Farms. Oh yes. <laughs> oh, you know, and I heard this, and I just want to parallel this real quick. So, you lived in Brandon, Florida. Um. Bef uh, in like the 2000s. In high school, I actually okay. lived in New Hampshire. Because I was born in Tampa. My dad went to Brandon High School. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, lived... I didn't know if there was any correlation to that time frame. Because I can assure you, there was plenty of Boone's Farm going around in that time as well. <laughs> yes. 
um, yeah, so that was kind of like, you know, they started passing around some just, you know, high school substances, nothing, you know, nothing crazy. And I got, you know, pretty buzzed. And all of a sudden, something clicked in my brain. And all of a sudden, I was funny. And I was charming. And people liked me. And I didn't feel uncomfortable. And I thought, this is what I've been looking for my whole entire life. And that was the beginning of, you know, what progressed to needing more substances, trying different things, experimenting, going through all the phases. You know, I, w- I went um, through my, my rave phase. I was like the Jenko jeans and bad boy bill and glow sticks and um, all that kind of stuff. And I, I maintained school and I maintained many codependent toxic relationships. <laughs> and because I, if you're anything like me, I used relationships just as addictively as I used drugs. And, um, you know, that went on for a while. And then I, you know, found other ways, you know, to survive when I couldn't work anymore. And I found that through uh, prostitution and um, selling drugs and working at strip clubs and things like that. So it's funny because you mentioned um, how, and I parallel this to to just my own experience. Uh, If if there's one theme that I find um, that most of us addicts um, experience at a young age is the turmoil in the household that we pretended didn't exist. So we were constantly, constantly looking for the approval of the people in our house, but at the same time trying to pretend we're something else outside of the house because we had to have their approval obviously as well. Um, you know, we, it, it, you know, because of my father in the background, you know, the term kayfabe, but you know, we're, we couldn't talk about the things that were really going on. We, you know, I'd be at home. My mom would be just screaming and yelling and cussing. And then, you know, we're at church the next day and they're like, Oh, she's a saint. And I'm like, what? You know, like I can't, and I can't say anything because that would, that would be against the rules. And, and, and I think, I think that it's a, um, it's their way. You know, the, the unfortunate thing is we watched our, parents grow up too um and so you know the skills and tools and all that that they were given um it 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 wasn't any different than what they gave us and and they didn't have the ability so um when i when i kind of reference some of that and look back on that um it does give me a sense of understanding and it's i've certainly made peace and 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 resolved those resentments and and even recognize how, uh, you know, as I got older, um, I played into it. Um, but I just want to share, I was, you know, doing a little bit of research. And this is, you know, when I was growing up and, and, and I'm 45, almost 46, um, and I was wearing the polyester pants and the tight shirts, you know, from Structure, if you remember those days. Um, one of the things that it, it was so much more common back then that men were you know, in the world of substance abuse. And so the, the women that I experienced in substance abuse typically were at a strip club or they were the, you know, girlfriend of the drug dealer. And um, I even had one of my friends, um, his girlfriend got shot because they thought it was, thought it was him. And and, um, so as I kind of was moving forward in these trends that I've seen now, obviously our individual experiences took us down that path, but as I think about what's going on right now, this is this is just some recent statistics since uh, since uh, post pandemic. Um, heavy drinking by women, which is more than four drinks at one time, um, is up forty one percent. Alcohol related deaths is actually up fourteen point seven, which is a little over two percent higher than men. Um, opioid and drug overdose for women between the ages of thirty and sixty four. From, from our age group of, of when we were out in the scene from 1999 to, to pre-pandemic 2017, 
it's up 260 percent i couldn't find anything in the last five years and i almost wonder if they don't want to if they don't want to report it or if it just hasn't come through so um now 2017 correct me if i'm wrong uh that was the year before you found recovery correct um my recovery date is july 20th 2015 okay excuse me um so what have you seen based on what you experience and how quite honestly i found my drugs in those different environments it was kind of shady you it's not like it was so so prevalent and and, and available um what are you seeing in today's trends compared to what you know maybe you experience um versus what you're seeing today well i definitely feel like before you had to be like when i was in addiction you were kind of like a, a specific categorized party girl you know or you were a you know a, a lady of the streets or whatnot you know what i mean and um and that was you know the kind of person like i felt like other women when i was in my addiction either you were you know, way super shady, and that was like a small group of us, <laughs> or, you know, you were kind of like maybe a weekend party or something, you know, or a social user or whatever, and so now what I'm seeing is so many more women are using, and most of it has to do with uh, relationships, brokenness um trying to like cover up but there's just so many more women especially women who uh, have children and there are so many families that have been dismantled because of this and and that is really like the most heartbreaking thing um i have two children i have a 19 year old who i maintained um abstinence for a, a certain amount of time when he was a child and then uh you know but my daughter when she was born I was addicted to pain pills and they took her from me right away and that has been um something that's been really hard for me to kind of like deal with I get to see her um my mom has her but I never got to you know restore that relationship as being mom with her and so I'm she calls me mommy but but like you know my mom is the mom and so it's the guilt and shame from being a mom that keeps these women out there the the condemnation the not not being able to get their kids back because of you know whatever agency they can't you know make the plan work or they can't you know, some women, they can't even go to sober living because they do have their kids, right? They have to find a specific treatment center. So it's a lot harder for women to do that. And also, you know, it really takes, it takes a specific mindset. And I'm not talking about willpower. I'm talking about understanding that you deserve more. So just having like a, an inkling of the fact that you deserve better than the life you're living because women nowadays have been so conditioned to believe that they deserve this mediocre treatment whether that be from you know like in my case not seeing a correct view of what love is or from being in toxic abusive relationships which i see is being huge on the rise right now from being um, really like traumatized by predatory men and they just believe like that's all that they're worth, all that they're going to have. So it's harder for them to break through. So they have those barriers. <clears throat> I was, and as you know, one of the things that we, we, we do is try to find um, facilities for women. So I was going through... Um, uh, the Thor list, which was recently updated. And I was floored when I found that there was actually a facility that uh, allowed men, women, children, and sex offenders on the same property. Um, that, that just blew my mind. But if I went and dug in a little deeper, uh, just the number of women's facilities available. 
And if they do have them, you know, in, in most cases, it's, you know, if those obviously most of those are state funded, um, they might have 30 plus beds for men and like 12 for women. Um, the number of facilities that allow you to have children, I think, and, I, and I'm doing this off the top of my head, three out of maybe 30. And very, um, very small amount because it, uh, because of the way that the laws are, you can only have a certain amount of children and it's it's a very small amount. One I, I work with, I believe they're only allowed to have 10 at a time. Oh, so I guess, you know, there's, there's two sides of this and I want to speak to it from the ignorant male side and which won't be that hard. Um, it seems like a very unfair burden that men can go and get treatment. I'd honestly be selfish, and, and you know in recovery you have to be because that's how you take care of, you know, your focus is recovery. Um, but, you know, men get the opportunity to transition and to house it. You don't, you don't see men going to these facilities with their children, I guess is my point. Um, that just seems like I can't even fathom how that even changes, right? How do, like, how, I mean, it's, it, and it might be just be one of those questions that it is, is better answered in a group of people with everybody, you know, hashing it out. But um, how, how do these women in those situations, like, how do they find recovery? Because they're, they're not able to just, you know, I don't know about the daycare system or what, what's available from that standpoint, but. It seems like we're 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 shoe strapping the women, um, and, and not even giving them the opportunity to reestablish those reestablish those relationships. Because if they do the selfish thing that men get to do, they lose rights. And it doesn't seem like that's the like getting back into the life once you lose your rights is very difficult. Um, as I think, I, I don't know. I, I know you you got to watch the first episode, but um, my parents raised my brother's kids and i say my brother's kids but it was I had a mother too obviously um and i don't remember ever you know there being a big battle about it either it was just my parents raised them for the the rest of their lives and nobody nobody thought twice about it now i'm very close to one of them the other two i'm not as close to um for various reasons but um when when you go to help a woman that's you know you obviously have been there seen it you you know i'm I'm sure you're grateful for um, your mother being available for your daughter, but um, you know it's it's a different conversation when I'm telling somebody, "Hey, I know you need to get a job, but you need to take another month and focus on your recovery." Like, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that, but I'm suggesting it, right? Um, that's got to be a different conversation with women, and you being on that side of it. How, how do you tell somebody, "Hey, it's okay to let your kids go because otherwise you're not going to live." You know, or, or, or how, how does that conversation even begin? How, how do you approach that? So I would definitely encourage them that they are still a good mom. Like if, in fact, I believe that a mother's job is to keep their children somewhere safe. And if you cannot take care of yourself, you cannot be a good mom. You know what I mean? So it, it is better for you to put them somewhere safe. Now, it is hard. It was a very hard decision for me to make myself. You know what I mean? Like when um, there was a, a time when my son was young and his father had gone to prison and I kind of fell off the deep end and I gave my son to my mom and kind of went away for a little while. And so... I definitely always encourage them that like putting your child somewhere safe if you cannot take care of them is being a good mom. And just because you are not with them at the moment, you are still a good mom and you are still a mom. Like you don't ever like lose that, you know, of like having a child. You're never like not a mom once you have a child, you know. But there are, thankfully, some amazing organizations now that are coming up. One of them is called Moms Adopting Moms. And I'm going to tell you a statistic that I don't say online because uh, I feel like I will get crucified for it. But I'm just going to tell you, I did a study on mothers whose 
children actually died, like death. And they were, you know, uh, 45% of them had anxiety, 35% of them had, um, you know, depression, 15% had PTSD. For a mother to lose full custody of their children, the rates, 65% will develop PTSD. Over 50% will suffer depression and 75% will develop anxiety disorder. So it is a pretty traumatizing thing to have your children actually taken away from you like forcefully, you know? So um, Moms Adopting Moms is an amazing agency that kind of is uh, an advocate for mothers because here's the thing when you are stuck in this guilt and shame of losing your children even if you're on a, a plan right you're still you know the judgment the um you know the the social workers like all this stuff the the things that you have to go through seem like you're never going to be able to do it. So they have these advocates that come in and literally fight for you to continue relationship. Even if you decide to give your child up for adoption because you believe that is the best thing, you can still maintain relationship. So I think like the answer to the issue is to have more advocates and more organizations like that and just being able to have women who have been through it who can walk alongside that mom and encourage them and tell them like you can do this you know and and it is so sad Travis how many moms I when I went to sober living I stayed in sober living for three and a half years willingly <laughs> three and a half years now my sober living was on a big campus so I had like my own apartment for like the last like year and a half or whatever but um I willingly stayed because it was safe and I, I was able to see my children on the weekends I had started my own business um and I was just doing I was doing really well so I saw so many moms get their kids back and they weren't ready for them. And then they felt, you know, had a setback and their children had to be taken from them again. <clears throat> Two thoughts is, is it's, you know, it's, it's unfair because men never hear you lost your kids. They never say, they just don't say that. They may say you can't see your kids, but they don't say you lost your kids. Um, even if, you do lose your rights. Like it, it, just society approaches it. I think the court system approaches it very different as well. You know, I think most people think, you know, in a divorce, they favor the women and a divorce. Well, I don't think it's, I, I don't think it's as much like that anymore as it once was. I do believe at one point in time, but there was also different divorce laws where, you know, alimony was different. Alimony's changed since we were kids, right? Um, um, but the, the, the stigmatism of a judge sitting in front of a mother, it's like he expects more from you than he did the father. Um, and, and the advocacy has to be the first part. I think it's a change in, you know, because obviously I'm on these phone calls where these moms are like, I, you know, you very rarely, and, and this is just my experience, very rarely do I hear a man say, I haven't seen my kids. I've heard them say, I've got to get a job, you know, and they go to an environment that supports that. But on the flip side, the mom is going, I need to, I need to be there for my children. And their second thought is in order to do that is I have to have a job. So, so it's not that they don't, they don't interweave it, but it does appear. And, and, and I don't even know where to go with this, that responsibility for these children um, because let's just be honest, if the, the mom's dealing with addiction, they probably were in a relationship with the, with the husband that was dealing with addiction. You know, that's very married together. Um, no pun intended. Um, but, you know, the. How do we. How do we as a society, but even so, maybe keeping it granular, um, how do we in the sober community address that because in my mind 
I think of the different facilities and I think, well, gosh, none of them support it anyway. So even just the sober living like you were talking about, you had the opportunity and the foresight and the resource in your mom. Like you had some pieces that allowed you to do that and you were willing to. So, you know, while it is, it's not always it, that opportunity being there makes somebody more willing. Um, so I think about some of the folks that do want to transfer, and they may be six away, six hours away from their children. Um, and I was, I'm going to go to this real quick. Was I was watching a, um, a psychiatrist. Um, I'm going to say his name wrong, but I think his name is Dr. Gabor. Um, and they were talking about, you know, mama's boys is, is, was the topic. And uh, the, the presumption was that the mama's boys are the ones that the mom coddled the baby and picked them up when they were crying. And that was the ones that became very, uh, uh, had an unhealthy attachment. Um, and it was the exact opposite. They, they, they measured it with these children. Those were the kids that had the best attachments with women. And those are the ones that had the healthy relationships. Those are the ones, they weren't the mama's boys. The mama's boys are the ones that the parent didn't pick up the child when they were crying. And then they became anxiously attached. And so then they were codependent on the mom. Um, so, you know, whether anybody wants to believe it or not, your dad being in your life is absolutely important. Oh, yes. But your mother, there's a bond there that is different. You know, uh, to the point that um, I was very, very, very close to my dad. I'm, I'm not as close to my mom. Um, that's not blaming anybody. I'm just saying that's that's been my life. Um, and, and I credit, and I've said this in the past, uh, I credit a counselor for sitting with me and, and recognizing that and putting those behaviors I had together and not condemning me for it and going, you have this because of this. Let's start this process of healing. Um, so if you could wave a magic wand and, 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 you know, change one part of the system, let's say it's, whether it be the courts or the sober living, um, where would you start to, to, to make change um, just around, you know, and I didn't anticipate us going down this road, but it, it is, you know, that it, it's, it's personal now that I think about it. Like I, you saying it makes it personal because obviously having dealt with addiction, I can relate back to some of those relationships. If you could wave a magic wand and say, here's the starting point. Here's how we support women in recovery um, because you did it. And, and, you know, you are an inspiration and you have reestablished those relationships. What would be the first thing you would do um, to begin that process? Just let's just keep it simple within the recovery community. Housing. Yeah. So, you know, um, like extended housing, right? So giving uh, a mom the ability to stay, you know, on like in a, to have like a place for her, her children to come, you know what I mean? Having like, say she completes, you know, however many months, and then she can reestablish relationship with the child. They can start to come over, you know, say every, you know, weekend. And then, you know what I mean? After so long, but then still having the facility be associated with a, you know, a, a sober living of some sort so that they still have the accountability and they have resources available, uh, counseling, classes, all of these different things. That is the biggest thing is because without housing, I mean, where are we? And my first thought went somewhere a little different and, and, and probably because I'm just thinking of it from a male perspective. I feel like there's a lack of male accountability. Like these guys are in these sober living facilities and the only thing they've got to worry about is their rent and their food. There's no responsibility to help out those mothers in those situations. Like zero and whether it's state funded or not you know if it's private it's the same way and, and let's just be honest most of the private sober living facilities they're not making money like they those are generally speaking and i i think of several in my mind those are people that are in recovery and they have this job and this is where their service work is 
Um, mm. So my first thought is to go to, to male accountability. Um, and without, you know, I don't want to cross any lines with you or anything, but um, I'm assuming that wasn't something that existed in your own life and, and, and uh, the, the father of your children. Um, he came and went, you know, as he wanted. Um, so we have, you know, both of my children are from one father and, um, I remember he dropped me off at my mom's one time with uh, my son and said he would be back next weekend and didn't come back for six months. I didn't hear from him, you know, at all, just disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, so, yeah, and in a um, my recent marriage uh, also as well, you know, uh, I went to the gym and um, my husband moved out. <laughs> and, you know, and that was it and moved to a different state. And so it's, yes, like it is unfortunate the ability for that men can just leave families and have no remorse about it. You know what I mean? Uh, now, you know, my children's father is somewhat involved, you know, now they're grown. So he's with my with my son. Um, they have a, a decent relationship. My daughter, you know, is pretty estranged because he he left um, pretty much about a month after she was born. So. But yes, definitely the rising up of men, because I will tell you that in this season, I do believe that women are rising up. Women are going to be rising up and you can already see it happening. And we definitely need men to come walk into their position and and I want to you know encourage men like I don't ever want to say like you suck you didn't pay your child support you owe back taxes no I want to say listen this is not who you are like you are better than this and you have a role to play in this society to come and walk alongside even if it's not your um you know spouse or whatever you know what I mean like look at it as like your sister right like we were talking on the phone the other night about like you know we have to operate as like sisters and brothers and treat each other as such and there has been such a lack of this recently especially in the early um recovery community you know where I see a lot of women being taken advantage of because, you know, they're broken, they're beat down, they just want something to fill this hole. And I understand the men have the same things going on too, but I feel like the men need to rise up and un and, and understand, like, this is not you. This is not who you are. You are a man of integrity, if I may say so. You were a man created by God, and you need to rise up and walk in that. We all have to work together if we want to you know, this to happen. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of my people dying. Men, women, I'm tired of it. And we have to be united in the solution. Um, so this takes us to that subject we were talking about. I knew, I knew we'd get there because I think we're both pretty passionate about it. Um, um, so I remember, I'm always going to remember a story that brings it brings it something to light and i you know the the, the light bulb goes off um i had gone to a, a clubhouse for for an aa meeting and um it, it was one of my first ones at a clubhouse i had been to meetings but this was one that was down the street and i thought eh, i'll stop by i'll check it out it's only a few miles away and i got there and and so it had you know sofas kind of like in a you know in a circle you know semicircle and then it had um, you know some chairs in the back and during the meeting there was a guy there and, and I didn't know much about this facility yet to, to better understand that this was uh, uh, somewhere where men that were in um, in sober living or in a, a facility, this was one of the places they went and got dropped off at or, or could walk to. Um, but there was a guy there. It was a very attractive young lady. And so she sat on the in, in the semicircle at, on the couch. And during the meeting, when I tell you, um, and I'm openly the is the tension deficit is if there's a physical like definition of it, my picture is next to it in the dictionary. 
Um, but I was, I, I wanted to get up and leave because he would not stop talking to her. And that wasn't the thing that bothered me the most or that I, or it didn't click at this moment. So we go through the meeting and this is probably, I don't know, 90 days, you know, like, so this isn't like my first, like I'd been to several. Um, and then she got up and got her white chip. Which, if you don't know what that is, for those of you, that means it's that you've decided to choose this path um, of sobriety, and, and you're going to start going down this. You're going to you're going to find a sponsor. You're going to work this program. It means you've decided to not drink anymore um, or or give up a substance. And in that moment, when she stood up and got that chip, I was furious. Because not only did he distract, like, I was annoyed because he was distracting me. Let's just be honest. But it bothered me he was talking to her, but I didn't know if they knew each other. Like, because they were sitting next to each other, so I didn't I didn't have any kind of reference point. But when she stood up and got her white chip, I, I, I remember back, and um, I've watched different podcasts and different things where, you know, sponsors say, hey, wait, you need to, depending on the person, you know, every sponsor is different and every individual is different. Generally speaking, they say you need to either wait till you finish the 12 steps or you need to wait a year or both. We're going to see how this plays out and we'll have that conversation. I know when I started, my sponsor was like, let's just wait and then we'll have this conversation later. And ironically, I was talking to him. I was like, I don't think I've ever dated sober. Um, you know, I haven't done many things sober. And he's like, I'm going to be honest with you, neither have I, but I'm going to connect you with somebody when it comes time. So, like, I think there's a, a, a genuine responsibility of the men that are in recovery to hold the newcomers accountable because that shouldn't be happening. Like, you you know, and, and, and the scary part is that was one situation. And then I was at another, uh, uh, it was, I went to a facility because somebody invited me and it was a ton of men and there was literally one woman that came in and it was her first time being back in seven years. And so she gets up to get her white chip. And I, I remember leaving and blocking like three guys from going to her. And then I opened the door. I said, are you leaving? She said, yes. I said, me too. And I walked out. And we, we went our separate way. She got in her car and, and she left. But you could tell she was trying to get away. Um, so I think there's a level. In fact, I'm going to put the onus on the men. Because if, if we're not... If, if iron sharpens iron, um, you know, and I absolutely respect and believe that women should be saying this as well, um, but we're the ones sponsoring them. You know, it is our responsibility to go, here's some rules of etiquette in this group. Um, and to take it a step farther, um, I think the groups need to start ensuring those etiquettes are followed. Because it is something that is already written for the record. Like that's an expectation to not make anybody in the, you know, uh, uncomfortable, at, at, you know, in, in tradition. So um, I, that's where my mind goes to first. Um, but, you know, not to divert away from, you know, our recovery or AA or anything. Um, but I do want to just shed light on this and I want to have this conversation. Um, I have, I very rarely use social media outside my dad's accounts. Chris, our producer, um, is the only, <laughs> he's getting, encouraging me to do more, right? And which is like completely out of my wheelhouse. I'd rather go talk to you about it than, than post it. Um, and if I'm posting, it, I'm like, why would I tell all these people this? I don't really care if they know. Um, but, you know, in order to, you know, it's not to grow a fan base, but it is to reach as many people as you can because I see the growing rates of alcoholism. I see the changes in men. I believe that the amount of pornography available is corrupting and destroying the minds of more people than we realize. And it's, you don't even have to go find it. It's straight in social media. Um but with that being said, I can imagine because I, I messaged you, you know, the first time to tell you thank you for your video. I, don't, I didn't realize you didn't know which one I was referring to. Um, but I think I was so excited. But I, I'll be honest, with you, I was a little nervous because I was like, I've never done this. I've heard it called sliding into somebody's DMs. Right. And so my hesitance was, 
I don't want her to think I'm thinking anything other than thank you. So I remember reading my words a couple times to make sure that they reflected what I was trying to express. Um, but you've had what I would consider to, to be just straight up pornographic messages sent to you. Um, and it seems to happen on a regular basis. How, um, how do we get people to understand, one, that's not acceptable, um, two, that I feel like that, like if I went out and walked out naked in front of my house, that would be indecent exposure, right? Not to say that I wouldn't do it. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident, but I wouldn't, right? Um, even if my dad did wear tights on television. Um, tell me if you could just kind of maybe sum up some of the experiences you've had. Um, I don't think, I, I didn't know this. Like you told me, and I was like, are you for real? And you're like, yes. If you could just kind of enlighten some people about some of the things that you experience. And um, Jamie, like I, I, I say this, and I say this with all due respect. You are a daughter of God. You are my sister in Christ. Yes, you are a beautiful woman. Um, I think I'm a good looking man. That's not bad to say. However, that's not what happens. What are some of the things, obviously, without going into detail, what are some of the things that men need to understand that women experience inside that world? Well, number one, you know, you really never know who you're sending anything to. So one thing that I like to do when guys send me videos or pictures is say, um, do you know who this is? What if this is a 10-year-old little girl? You would go to prison. <laughs> and so one thing you need to be very aware of that you really don't know who you're sending things to, um, number one. And number two, nobody is ever going to call you <laughs> because you send them something like that. Like, that is not... I mean, I, I instantly block. I just got one yesterday. This guy, he called me like four or five times on my messenger and then wrote some things about what he would like to do to me <laughs> and sent some pictures. And I was just like, what? And I, you know, report and block. Um, the most disturbing one recently was it said the profile was a girl. And she started sending me pictures, but she, in this, in her profile, she said she was like 20 something. But then in her picture, she looked like she was like 13. And she sent me two different girls on two different occasions, pictures. And then I still didn't respond to her. And, and they sent me pictures of uh, the inside of panties. And what looked like uh, in a, like a fitting room or something like that. But there was a man standing with his boots that was taking the picture. And I was like, are you trafficking women? Are you going into women's fitting rooms and taking pictures of women's panties? Like, what is this? Like, um, so the world is just getting more and more perverted and disgusting. That is never, ever acceptable. I am pretty sure it, it it is a crime, like you were saying. So I feel like, you know, the the media platforms need to have more kind of like reinforcing of things, especially now with the things going on in the world, with the um, <coughs> trafficking, the, all the child stuff, and, and all this stuff is just coming more and more to light. And, you know, the thing you were talking about with, pornography you know there is a pornography weakens the man's mind and, and it and it is literally an addiction you know it hits those dopamine things it literally ruins families it ruins marriages um it will ruin your intimate life because you will just keep needing more and more just like a drug so men need to understand like the dangers of that not only that but it is demonic Literally, when you are by yourself watching pornography, doing your own thing, you are literally in the demonic world doing that with demons. <laughs> so um, from a spiritual sense, that's really what's going on. If you could take your glasses off and see. Um, 
not to get too deep into that, but that is truly what is going on. And that is why I, I always try to like encourage the men rather than bash them because it's almost like they can't help it because they've been programmed to this and, and it's they've been brought up as this, like it's society's norm. They're patted on the back for it. And that needs to stop. Like we were saying, we need to raise up a standard of men who who are willing to say no you know what, if I wouldn't want somebody sending something like that to my daughter, I'm not going to send something like that. And I'm not going to pat someone on the back for doing it either. And so I, I, I'm not going to preach to be holier than thou or, or, or get up on my high horse. It's I, I'm not going to lie. I've used it in the past. And it was something that I had to confess, recognize um, the way that, uh, uh, you know, I went to a men's class at church on it. Um, I was floored at how deep that rabbit hole went. Like, I, I, you know, you're sitting back, you're like, oh, that could happen, right? Um, and it's, you know, I remember, you know, because I don't, it's funny because everybody tells me they see this stuff on social media. Maybe it's because of how little I interact. I genuinely don't. Like, but the other day, I, of course, as soon as I say I never see it, Bam, like, it's like somebody, you know, God's like, yep, it really exists. I told you. And it was like somebody's profile. Um, on the flip side of that, my dad's, my dad's page got shut down because somebody got upset about an interaction. I'm um, not with me, but, um, uh, you know, with other fans on the, on the site. And so it got paused. And at the same time, I'm like, this gets paused and there's nothing on here but positivity. But I accidentally, not not in my hidden request, it was like somebody had liked a photo of mine, and all I did was click on the response, and there it was. And I did not, I mean, like, when I tell you, I, now I kind of get the idea where you're like, oh my God, like, this complete shock and awe, and you're like, what just happened? Like, why is this happening? And, and, and the reason I bring it up is because... Um, Women are the ones that are experiencing it, but men are the ones that are doing it. Um, and everybody wants to blame women in the sense because, you know, oh, you know, you can go through and see who gets the most follows and the most likes, and it's the pretty girls. Like, facts. Um, but they don't ask for anything back. Like, that doesn't... But just, that doesn't allow you to then go to the next extreme because they posted a picture, which, by the way, they're in clothes, like, or at the gym. Like, is it revealing? Yes. It's not nude, and it's not a sexual act, and it's certainly not claiming these graphic things. But I think where I wanted to go with that um, is, one, I want to bring light to it because I think um, that's the only way that, you know, you bring light doesn't get consumed by darkness, you know, um, and, 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 and darkness cannot consume light. Um, so I feel like having the conversation, being transparent, um, talking with other men about it, you know, saying, hey, I've been guilty of this. And here's the decisions I've made. What hit me the hardest wasn't seeing the rabbit hole went down. It was hearing that I believe, and, and, and I'd have to go back and double check. So I hope I'm not wrong when I say this. Um, it wouldn't be the first time I've been wrong. Um, over 60% of the pornography on the internet is for, from people that are being trafficked. Um, it's not people that are willingly um, uh, involved. Either they're being trafficked from an abusive relationship, uh, they're unaware they're being filmed, is, is one of the things you mentioned. Um, I, 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 I segue to this because I think this is very relevant and we, we mentioned it in, in the cases, you know, with the, the chips and um, how do women protect themselves in today's culture? Not the, the social media. I don't have an answer for. I find it difficult that we're worried about TikTok and China having our profiles, but a 12 year old can see that, you know, um, I, 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 you know, you've been to some of these AA groups. I have a hard time that, Non-alcoholic beer, you have to be 21, but you can buy mouthwash that is 14 to 27% alcohol. And you can buy hand sanitizer that is 100% alcohol, which never crossed my mind to drink, by the way, 
until, you know, not until because I never thought about it anyway, but until I heard about high school kids doing this. And that's where they started drinking, which just baffled me. But being a woman in recovery, being uh, vocal and having an online presence, having the number of followers you have. Um, so I feel like my responsibility is one, to take responsibility. And second, to be willing to have a conversation with somebody like you that has these experiences that can say, you know what, this isn't okay. Um, but how do women protect themselves um, in recovery? And, and I mean, like, I know there's women AA groups. I know there's women's NA groups. Um, but they are vulnerable. Um, they are, in many ways, codependent on a, a man and the relationships that those forge. Uh, there is a financial need in a lot of cases. Um, so um, I know that I personally try to create an environment that I keep my distance. There's no touching, you know, things like that. Like, um, but what do women do to protect themselves in a predatory environment with obvious, obviously men that have mental health that are, that are dealing with alcohol? So on the men's side, we need to tell men it's not okay. It needs to be something we're very vocal and there needs to be a level of accountability. Like if you see it in your group, go say something. It's not okay to not say something. Um, but what do women do to protect themselves? How, how do you get into recovery knowing it's a male dominated world, um, much like corporate America was at one point, which we've seen a shift, not a perfect shift, but a shift nonetheless. Um, how do they, how do you get into recovery and not end up in one those relationships or two in an environment that you're not safe i love that you asked that in the way that you put it um thank you for you know taking the accountability in that and being a man that will you know stand up against this i call them a, a mordecai man you know and um we need more so for women, the biggest thing, of course, like you were talking about, the, the no dating thing, that goes so far um, because, you know, I took a 18-month period in my sober living where I, um, after I kind of <laughs> backlashed on my sponsor a couple of times, you know, and she kept telling me, like, no, we need to finish these steps and then you can date. And I was like, I can do it my way, you know, and I ended up like dating this guy and um he knew a bunch of scripture and his dad was a pastor and I had 18 months and he had six months and I was like, no, this is this is it. And after, you know, a month, uh, we broke up and he ended up leaving the sober living and didn't come back for two years back into recovery and although it was not my fault he left the sober living I I felt that I did not want to have anybody's blood on my hands I did not want to have anything to do with someone leaving a sober living because they you know of a relationship issue right so that goes about like you know people like caring about people in early recovery with like a, a true heart, like a, a brother, you know, but, um, for women, you have to, you know, stay with other women. Um, you know, there's all different programs now. Everything is different. It's not just like, uh, you know, just AA, NA, whatever. Like there's so many different things now, but finding, strong women and they don't even have to be necessarily like in recovery they could be in um the business world in your fitness class in you know whatever it is like uh, even online right like finding strong women who will help you understand your identity because this is the biggest thing with women is they do not understand their identity they do not understand what they are worth they have all of these false belief systems that they, you know, uh, are unlovable and unworthy and are, are only, you know, deserving of the things that they have seen. And they don't believe in themselves, right, that they can do these things. And for me, like, I never understood, you know, when I first came into sober living, it was so hard for me, um, you know, as a, uh, I consider myself a, a person in recovery from sex work, 
And I would love to tell you that when I first came into recovery, all that stuff went away, but it didn't. <laughs> it didn't. I still had a boyfriend on the side helping me pay rent, give, help, getting me rides, you know what I'm saying? And it was actually a one of the staff members called me out because she was looking at my paychecks and she said, wait a second, you just paid this amount, but your paychecks don't add up to that, you know? And she was like, you need to learn how to be self-sufficient. And it was just like baffling to me. Like, well, how am I going to do that? And you know what I did is I, um, I I got a second job. I, I worked two jobs. I didn't have a car for the first 18 months of recovery. I, re- I learned how to ride the bus, right? Um, and I had to make a lot of sacrifices to the cushy little life that, that you can have when you can, you know, depend on men. But I'm going to tell you something. I did not have to sleep with anyone for anything. I didn't have to do anything I didn't want to do anymore. Like I was, you know, I was able to be free and independent and myself and also learn to depend on God also. So that was like huge for me. Um, so for women to protect themselves, it's like, I can tell you in the dating world, you know, the big things, don't ever let anybody take your phone. Um, don't let people you don't know into your house. They can put cameras in. Uh, don't go into, you know, somebody somebody you don't know's house and, and, and get naked because you don't know if they're recording you or not. This From experience, this happened to me. Um, I was involved with this little circle of, of men that kept me very high and passed me around and recorded me and put me on the internet. And I'm sure that they made, you know, whatever they made off of it. But um, that was, that was a terrible, terrible feeling, you know, when I realized what was going on. And so, like, ladies, like, it is so dangerous, you know, nowadays, especially people, women in early recovery, Society sees us as disposable. We are not we are not held to anything of value. So we have to hold ourselves to value. Like we have to look out for ourselves and and you have to stick together. I know when I first came into recovery, I did not know what a relationship uh, a healthy relationship with a woman looked like because I had a very strained relationship with my own mother. So for me to get a sponsor and, you know, talk to a woman every day was very strange to me. Um, in the drug world, women were in competition, right? We were in competition to get the, uh, to be with the next drug dealer or the, or the next person with the, with the bag to get the next deal. So that was something that I had to learn, but understanding to trust the process, I would say, and for women to be willing to help each other up. And not only that, but for women to be willing to ask for help, right? Like they had to tell me, this is what they told me, uh, sis, uh, you need to, you need to take a shower every day. Uh, you, you gotta go get a job, but, oh, you can't wear that. You can't wear that to go get a job. (laughs) You know, like, like they had to like correct me on these things because I had been living one way for so long. I didn't know. So there's no shame in that, right? We just didn't know. We, we come in, we're broken, we're programmed. We are, you know, living off these false beliefs and values and we need help. And, Finding someone who will look, who will like look after you and help like bring you up and women like sticking together is so, so, so important. Don't ever go, you know, anywhere by yourself. I would always suggest going to like meetings with another woman, Um, you know, just taking all those kind of precautions because it's so much more dangerous nowadays than it ever has been before. Um, I'm going to take this just a little bit, step, one step further, um, and, and uh, without, you know, maybe giving any context to, to what we've discussed. But so I was at one point in time a loan officer. And what I would share is, ladies, um, so know this from a guy, you do not know how much information. I can find on you with your first last name in the city you live in. Like, it, and I used to do that, not for that reason, but 
because if I needed information for mortgage, I could pull those information. Um, but it like it, it you, you be careful. Google yourself. That may sound narcissistic. Google yourself and see what comes up. Find out what you can delete. Remove some of that information. Don't like if you're married, use your maiden name. If you're if you're not, use a different. Like I don't care what you have to do. Use a first name. Use a handle. I'm telling you, um, and I never took advantage of it. But I used to tell women I, that I dated. Um, I'm like, you should not have your full name on your profile. Like it's a dating profile. Like you shouldn't have your full name. You have your first name. Like don't put. You know, at, at, at the time I was on the South Side, so don't put Peachtree City, put Atlanta, because the, that if the name with Atlanta won't pull up, the same thing, and they all were like, "Oh my God, you, did you look at me?" I was like, "Yes, I wanted to know you were real too." Like, so, like from my side, I was making sure. Never did I ever do anything with that beyond that, and I had only learned it from the mortgage. Like it was easy. Like I know this is going to sound like a bad way to put it, but. Um, me not dating in early sobriety was very, very easy because I, I felt so awkward. Like there, again, I still, I, like I am, I'm completely awkward. I just own it now. Now I don't care that I'm weirdo. Like I'm like, if you can't handle my energy, I don't blame you. It's hard for me half the time. Like it's it's okay. Like if if it's gonna be too much to hang out with me because every time you say something, I'm gonna go like Google it and figure out like how I can, you know attached to this like in a good in a, in a in a good way or like you're going to get a random article from me about something i know you think is important like if that bothers you that's fine because i can't stop it <laughs> but i can tell you that aside um i um even i it, with the and understand people follow me because of who my dad is i know that and i'm good with it i'm okay with it i got some good stories about them pretty funny um but i'm still careful about what i share because even as simple as it is um and this happened to me recently and it was the first time that i went oh that's what happens to women somebody wanted to i I can't remember exactly what they wanted to do but the, the short version is um they saw my dad's uh ropes and they wanted to come to my house to take pictures of them and I went like they were like you live in this town right and I'm like dude I I know you on Facebook like why are why are we going down this path and I've never done that but I tell women like this is what happens I just never anticipated it ever happening to me and it was only in the last year and I was like oh this is what it's like and 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 I will tell you um and I and I say this having no depth or understanding of what you actually go through, Jamie. I really don't. Like, I can't. It's hard for me to fathom somebody doing it, much less at the volume you receive it. Because you were like, oh, it happened today. And I'm like, I didn't expect you to say that. Like, I, I mean, I didn't. Like, I was like, oh, well, that was a crappy question, <laughs> you know. Um, but when that happened, I I genuinely, and, and this is not like me drinking scared. Like, this was me sober. I was like. Oh no! Like I felt, I I, I genuinely felt a little nervous. I, I had anxiety. Um, I don't generally have anxiety very often. You know, ninety five percent of all you know uh, most like you know major crimes, murders, uh, uh, rape, uh, uh, incest, uh, obviously. Um, molestation like it i think it's 90 95 percent are from somebody you know so in my mind uh the 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 doorbell that catches the amazon driver is a waste of money and your 40 bucks a month is a waste of money too that's just my personal opinion um they've done statistics uh on theft that the number one deterrent from somebody breaking into your house they don't know if you have an alarm on they know you have the sign out front that says you have one so it's like that's the actual deterrent. They they're, they're not going and checking the wiring. That happens on like you know older '80s Bruce Willis movies. Um, it's the people around you. It's the small environments you go to. It does happen on the internet. That's where you get violated. But where bad things really happen are your normal interactions in life with people you 
give it a level of trust you shouldn't give it to. And where are you going to trust people the most? In recovery. Because you assume, and I did too, uh, my sponsor, several, it's probably on, I, I, I think it was on step four. And, you know, I, I, just to, to share, because that was, you were sharing some of your step four. That, like when you were saying, I was like, damn, if she can say that, then I can say it. Like it gave me courage. It genuinely gave me courage. Um, and that's what was so inspiring was your level of honesty allowed me to be honest with myself. Because there were some things in there like I'm talking about right now that I wouldn't have said, you know, months ago. Right. I would. have. It was those skeletons because I didn't want to talk about, um, you know, uh, I, I get emotional a lot, but I'm trying to work on it. But that will always be the biggest regret of my life was being unfaithful to my wife. Um, mm-hmm. You can't make up for it. There's no real amends. There's, there isn't. That, that's, a, that's, again, one of those debts I cannot pay. And all the things that come after that and the ripple effects that come from it. Um, and the people around that that I had to make amends to, right? Um, but I remember starting my resentments and I'm like, I got like five or six things. And then like, you know, 75 to 100 pages later, I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, my God. Like, and then, you know, you do step five, you confess. And then like the next week, I got like two a day coming up. And I'm like, I forgot about this and I forgot about this and I forgot about this. Um, all that to say, um I think for men, and, and possibly for women, I, I don't know this for a fact. I think for men, that's the one, that's the one path they don't go down, from what I can tell. Um, they don't go down that road of, um, and I use the example, uh, men think it's okay to comment on a 19-year-old girl. that Now, granted, d- does she need to make that picture? Probably not. Um, but as I see it, I'm like, oh, sweetie, you don't like, this is where you're getting your Mm self-esteem. You know, uh, I, I used the example before of, um, you know, when I see likes and follows and like, it genuinely doesn't, it doesn't phase me at all. Um, what gets to my heart is when somebody sends a comment or a message and like a good one that says like, Hey, I love that this is positive. Boy, that was wholesome. You know, that kind of stuff is the stuff that I'm like, all right, somebody's getting the message. Right. But, um, I, you know, when men in, inside of our community and I say our community, both the church, cause, uh, we're both pe- people of faith, um, uh, both the church, um, and, and, um, you know, in, inside of recovery, like that, that Pandora's box needs to open. Um, because I don't think until we start holding ourselves accountable, um, you know, it was, it was several. So my recovery really started like five years ago. Well, maybe, maybe it might've been six. Um, but my first, my first thing was, was handling my porn the amount of pornography I was using and, and other activities I was, I was a party to. That was my first addiction that I was like, oh, I don't know how I got here. I never planned this. I never even used it. It was kind of correlated to some other things, but I went into a men's group that that was when my eyes were open to what happens in that world. And so I can recall um, people would call me and say, hey, watch this movie. And I'm like, is there nudity in it? No, because I knew if I saw that and it was the craziest thing, Jamie, I remember driving down, I was driving through my neighborhood and it's one of those kind of, uh, sober moments, if you will, just moments of clarity, epiphanies of God going, see, I told you so, you know, which he does a lot with me, uh, all the time. Um, but I remember finally getting to the point that I passed a woman jogging and I didn't turn my head. And I went, all right, we're on to something. And it, was, it wasn't that I was doing something so different. It was the things I removed that made the difference it, for me. Um, it was the things I didn't dabble with. Um, you know, 
uh, it, it's so impulsive. It's 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 even more impulsive than I think a the, a normal addiction is because it's mm-hmm. your midbrain, which is part of your primal instinct. Like it's a natural instinct. It's how we use it and how quickly we're getting hits in both places, both from the dopamine response. Um, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that the use of pornography has the very similar, similar chemological, neurological effect to meth. Like mm-hmm. the way that the response is, is very similar. Like there's, there's different response systems that when you compare, like I think sugar and cocaine are very close. Now, we're obviously, mm-hmm. we're talking about extreme levels, right. um, you know, very, very high dopamine differences, but it's very similar. Um, uh, which is where we lean into that. So um, I, I know we've kept you longer than we anticipated, and I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, I really want to finish on something, and I, and I hope you're uh, comfortable with it. I think you will be. Um, so we've talked about a lot of things that we need to change. Um, I heard a lot of things I need to work on. Um, because I can say I do these things, but I don't know that I do them to the level that I need to. It's it will make me more aware and it'll make me more proactive. Um, it's a little different when you're hanging out. I obviously have a different crew now, um, but it's a little different when I was hanging out with the old crew going, yeah, I don't watch nudity. It's kind of like hanging out with them saying, I don't drink alcohol. And they're like, what? And it was the same response. Like what? Like you want to freak out a guy and you tell him you don't drink. They're like, ah, you'll come back. You tell him you don't watch pornography. They're like, they just give you the funniest look like you're lying. And, and most of them are. Um, so, so the thing that I want to, um, end with, if, if you don't mind is you were doing something, I mean, you do a lot of things. You're, 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 I mean, you genuinely are a pillar in the community of both recovery. Um, you know, knowing that you're doing the, you know, the interviews that stand up for recovery, um, branching out, if you will, um, you know, being, I mean, you're, you're already bubbly, you're already a light, but you're embracing that side, which, um, you know, just from being friends with on social media, I know you don't always see yourself that way. Um, I know you don't always see yourself as the, the funny and witty one and the bubbly one. I know that might be changing or it has changed over time, but I've seen your posts about being awkward and we all are. Um, <laughs> you're very I'm, socially just, awkward. <laughs> just, oh, I'm a, I'm a big freaking weirdo and people are like, Oh, your dad's famous. And I'm like, that made it worse. Yeah. You know, like yeah. It didn't make it better. Um, <laughs> what I really want to end with is, um, and this might take a few minutes, but you have done something and, and I consider myself pretty well versed in, in the world of, um, and I, when I say recovery, I mean, physical recovery, rehabilitation. Um, I've had multiple surgeries. Um, I think six now. Um, they were major. It was 50 staples from elbow to chest, two back surgeries, one spinal fusion, complete deterioration of my sacrum joints. Um, I know you went on a fitness journey and a weight loss journey that um, is really difficult to do after. Like, there's three things that are hard to quit when you go to recovery. Three things. Caffeine, like the drugs are easier than this. Caffeine, nicotine, and sugar. Those are the three hard ones that when you get into recovery, because it's the one thing that everybody says you can have as much as you want. Um, And so um, you have done something that I, when I say I know nothing about, like I have this small little inkling of an idea, but you actually, you, you wrote protocols, um, which still, I'm still wrapping my mind around this um, around uh, uh, massage and how to use that skill set and different types of lighting um, to deal with trauma, um, which, you know, the whole point of all this, yes, we've had some hard conversations. Um, and I, I still think these conversations, even though they're tough, are all about giving people hope. Even if it's somebody hearing, that's not okay anymore. Or I need to look at myself and be different. That to me is hope. Because the most hope I ever got was from people that didn't tell me what I needed to hear. Or what I wanted to hear. They told me what I needed to hear. And that's where I found hope. 
and again, go as far as you want. You have established what I consider to be um, us getting back to um, some of our actual natural historical ancestral roots using different lighting. And, you know, I think of it from the, the this landscape that God gave us, the beauty of, of nature, the beauty of a sunset, the beauty of a sunrise and all the different things that we can absorb in those different periods. You know, the further we get inside a building, the further we get away from God's creation. Um, although I'm a big fan of air conditioning. Um, so, um, you have taken what could have been easily down the route of 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 an addiction. You know, men don't use the massage appropriately. Let's not kid ourselves. You've turned it in a, into a way um, to heal people, and I, you know, it, I, that might be a whole nother podcast, but um, just. To me, that was something for somebody who has gone through so many different, like pelvic floor dysfunction. I've gone to that doctor, had to find one that would work on a man uh, because they have to touch you different. And yes, they do. Um, Mm -hmm. So you've taken, you've taken your skill set. You've written an entire protocol. You now teach this around trauma massage. Um, Tell me a little bit about that. Kind of expand on how you use that. And what it's done for you and for your patients. So when I came to this, it was uh, 2018. And I was literally, um, I was working on somebody in the recovery community. And I was like, you know, wouldn't it be so cool if we could like use massage in recovery? Like we could use it, you know, for um, to help people, you know, relapse prevention. We could help people stabilize on mat meds. We can help people with like se- severe anxiety and teaching um, people about healthy touch and help with trauma to calm down the central nervous system. And I was just started like going off. I'm working on her. I remember um, she works at one of the uh, sober livings right here in Athens. And I remember working on her and I was like, yeah, you know, we could use like colored lights and we could use essential oils and <laughs> music frequency and acupressure points and then do like positive affirmations, you know, and just like literally it just downloaded into me. Like it was just like, bam. And it was so cool. You know, I took the two things that I was so passionate about, massage and recovery, and put them together and got to literally, like, bless the whole community with it. So what you do is is actually a customizable program. So you can use, you know, different lights because different lights cause different things. I say, you know, like... um, orange lights green lights you need creativity do you need energy do you need to calm down right like depending exactly on what you have going on in that moment i can take you in 30 minutes and flip your whole day around in 30 minutes right you could be ready to walk out the door of sober living and go get high and throw the whole thing out the window give me 30 minutes and you're gonna be like oh (laughs) it's not so bad i can keep going um So it's really exciting because, you know, essential oils is the same thing as with lights. Um, Lavender to calm down. Do you need like an energizing something or other? Do you you need like a a spearmint? Do you need some orange? Um, Orange or tangerine? You need some creativity, right? And then you take music frequencies. Same thing. Everybody knows about music frequencies, right? We do like meditation or whatnot, right? Um, if you're spiritual, you can put on worship music, right? Or, or whatever. Um, and then there's different acupressure points that do different things in the body. And then you have the power of your words, positive affirmations. You know, if you are, I use the example of a person in early recovery and you have to walk around for four or five hours to job search on foot and you're still kind of you know trying to get your your brain right from you know coming off of drugs and whatever your sleep patterns still aren't good and you have to go actually talk to people (laughs) and like apply for jobs right this is terrifying and you want me to walk what this is my experience this is the only reason i can say this you know um oh i I, I 100 percent 
Like, it, even if you're, like, just going to the gas station and not being a freak, right? Like, because you're like, hey, I'm calm. I'm in a good mood. Like, and you're learning how to be that way for the first time. Like, it takes a while for the quiet to be natural. And you're used to so much noise. Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, and essential oils and things also de- help can help with detox detoxing your body and things like that too there's so many benefits besides the fact that massage just feels good right <laughs> and and to have somebody be able to like guide you through those things so i created this whole protocol i wrote this like whole like pamphlet book on it how to do it all the different things you can interchange for whatever a person has going on and i this is right when i became a um a CPS with Georgia Council and so I remember bringing it to them in my interview and I was like my name's Jamie and I'm a massage therapist and I've created this program <laughs> and I just like totally like gave them the whole thing and uh, then I was working at the time as a uh, recovery coach no, no no I was on the board of directors for Divas Who Win Freedom Center who is an organization here um, that helps women coming out of human trafficking prostitution and recovery and I told her about it and she said hey Let's do it. Let's let's start it. So I, I created this wellness room in this organization that is so close to my heart. And then, you know, for three years, I did massage there on Mondays and got to work on so much of the community. But, you know, after three years, I was like, wait a second, <laughs> we need to multiply. <laughs> like, it can't be just like just me doing this. Right. So um, got into a relationship with the Oconee School Massage that had just opened up and figured out a way because I I had some friends on the board of massage that we could allow the students to get their clinical hours working at the um, Diva Center. And that is, you know, how it happened. And it's been going strong ever since. And I get to go supervise sometimes over there and, and train the therapist, which is amazing because I also get to be an advocate for recovery and teach them how to work on people with trauma. So... It's it's been really amazing watching the whole thing kind of like grow from like, you know, making this thing, like downloading it into like sitting there and like just watching it happen. And the benefits that it has for so many people is just amazing. I'm so sorry. We have a special guest. This is Eleanor. I know. She is so cute. Oh, my goodness. I was, like, trying not to get distracted. Like, oh I my know, goodness. and I didn't mean to, but she was not going to let up, and it was about to be a loud bark. And let me just tell you, this this dog. The, oh, the, 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 Say hi. Say hi. She's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> A um, little baby dog. That's, that's, that's Eleanor. She's three years old. She's full size. Wow. Um, believe me, her bark is actually <laughs> worse than her bite. Um, uh, no. So, so what's funny is when I um, going back. This is a couple years ago. When I uh, was when it was time for me to get my spinal fusion, um, I was in so much pain. And like, you know, they give you a diagnosis. You know, I, st- I have a broken bone in my wrist they can't fix. When you have that level of pain, there's no pill for that. It doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Like, I, like, so when I originally broke my arm, they put me on 24 pain pills a day and, and 20 gabapentin. And so, or no, 30 gabapentin. Yeah, it's like 9,000, like three times the amount you're supposed to take. And after I tapered off those, everybody was giving me high fives, right? Well, you can imagine I was... I, I went through withdrawals. I went through what it would be like to go and come off all those pills. And that was where all these, I started drinking more. And then it took me down that dark path I had never planned on. So when I started my own recovery um, uh, uh, in preparation for my spinal fusion, you know, they, they scared me. And, and they told me what would happen if I didn't, um, I didn't figure this out. And, and so, you know, it started with diet, right? Started with being active and becoming flexible. Um, and and um, it was the first, I couldn't believe it. I was, was I 44? No, I was 45. But I was doing a split at 45 years old. And, and you know, I would have never thought I'd be able to do that, right? Um, and uh, so, so I went down this path of, 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 of knowing that there was a connection between my spiritual life uh, my my faith in Christ, 
um, and science. Like they they can co in fact they should coexist. You know, uh, God kind of made everything, so right. it's going to work together. So you know, it started with sounds. It started with understanding. I remember one of the first things uh, I had gone to a, a, a sound studio when I was in my late twenties out in California. And, you know, the sound of a, and I'm not giving anybody an excuse here for the record, the sound of a baby crying at that decibel, men don't hear it when they're sleeping. It doesn't resonate. So there is actually something neurological about them. Not wait, like it's real that they don't hear the baby. It's not excusing it, but the lower tones, like the door opening, um, women don't hear it. It, that doesn't mean it completely you're blocking it out. It means that just genetically, you know, over time, you know, and, and the sounds that they compared that men heard were like the sounds of a roar, you know, things that would be uh, that would would be unsafe. Well, we live in a house, so there's not many things uh, in the house to be un, that you have to worry about. But those are things that I started to go down this path of like, how can sound calm me down? And, and so I actually came to this point. And so knowing you're doing this felt like a, a, a little bit of validation, but it also felt like a very big encouragement for me to continue down that path. Because, um, yes, the, like, you, I, I believe there's a direct connection between God using what we have and allowing us to heal. So when we talk about the power of prayer, you think about... Um, the simplicity of giving it over to God and how it relaxes your body. Well, a relaxed body heals faster. There's, you know, so it's like you, you, you don't have to separate them. Like the two go hand in hand. In fact, um, there, this is something I learned, um, pretty early on that, you know, uh, when you say grace before a meal, one of the things that, you know, what a shocker that it's been, we've been doing it in every society for thousands of years, um, but when you say grace um, uh, and you pause that 30 seconds before a meal, your brain has the time to tell your stomach to produce the protein ghrelin, which then your amino acids attach to, which means you're not mindlessly eating. So you'll actually be satiated faster by the fact that you said grace before your meal. So there's this science that backs up all of these things that we've done throughout history. Fasting, you know, the, the direct correlation of that being um, that it increases autophagy. It's also a stressor. So it does help with uh, your body's ability to fight off disease because it's like a workout. Like there's all these correlations. And then when you went down the path of the lights, I think back to the fact we are indoors. So we're not exposed to the different, you know, different colors of the sun. Like and how, like, we see the greens and the blues and the reds and the oranges. And, well, orange is during the day. What a surprise. That's creativity. But we've always associated those colors with emotions. We've always, like, I saw something, not, not to be funny, but it was a scene from a movie uh, with Bruce Lee and uh, Chuck Norris. And, and they were talking about how mood music matters. And instead of the fight scene music, they were playing... Uh, uh, George Michael never gonna uh, uh, dance again, you know. And as they're taking off their geese and how it turned it into the sexual interlude versus, you know, a fighting scene. And, and so we've always known that music. Um, I used this example the other day that we don't even know what our body is doing. Um, I had to quit watching sports pretty much because I would get anxious. Even if I didn't care who the team was, I would get physically ill before a Miami Hurricanes game. Like worried sick isn't a statement. It's a real thing that happens. Um, and so the direct, the direct correlation of anxiety to gastrointestinal issues um, and how relaxing your nervous system obviously helps with your gastrointestinal. So I found that if I reduced the amount of things I watched, my stomach didn't bother me as bad. When my stomach didn't bother me as bad, I had less acid reflux. And I had associated, granted, I drank too, so that was not helping at all. But um, I, I want you to know that I think that is one of the coolest things I've ever heard. It, it, I, it completely attaches and makes sense that you would find that. Um, because you found healing in so many different ways. Um, and, and for you to be able to use not only something you love, 
but something that God gave you, you know, and and, and put those together and use them in a way um, that really exposes people to their body. Because once you know what your mind and body can do and, and how it's influenced by different things, um, you know, the last one I used, I was watching a basketball game and the guy made a shot and it was like 1.6 seconds left. And I was like, I felt this. It wasn't elation. It was anxiety. And I was like, oh, I, you know, so so you taking you taking all of those gifts and putting them together like I, I, I don't know that I could have wrapped you up in a better bow than to know that that's what you've done um, in recovery is taken something that um, the beauty of God's creation and used it to heal people that may have never associated and they would have never known why they had the craving later. Until they were able to release that that tension somewhere in their body, so um, you're amazing. Um, you know, I think that um, you've you've inspired me in more ways than one. Um, knowing what you continue to do, uh, I'm grateful to have gotten to meet you, and uh, I'm sure I promise you, I'm going to see you at one of these stand up for recovery. Our, uh, comedy shows here coming up in the next month but um, thank you so much Jamie um, thank you for your honesty thank you for um, you shared things that I think would be uncomfortable for most women to say to a man um, and you said it with uh, respect um, and no way did I feel like you were tearing down myself or anybody else um, you did it in a way that encourages people so um, I'm so grateful, so grateful that I got to see that podcast that Friday night. I jokingly, Chris, and I know uh, they don't know why I look to my left, but I'm looking at you. Um, the first time I talked to her, I was like, you know, all of this is your fault. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, because Chris uh, wouldn't be in my life. And when he came to me with the proposition to do this, it would have never happened had I not seen you and you had the courage to be honest in that moment. So, uh, I'm forever changed because of your because of you and and you've blessed me so thank you so much. Ah, oh, thank you. I'm glad glad to know that somebody was listening. So, would you guys say like one just as long as it helps one person, right? That's all that matters. So, um, that was my awkward moment of the evening um, of of many. So, thank you so much for watching. We 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 hope to see you soon. God bless and uh, be wonderful. <laughs>